hidden inside that story is an unacknowledged utility function. And to me, this is the frontier of how we should understand what we want renormalization and coarse graining to do. It took us a long time to realize that coarse grainings were secretly ideological things. Coarse grainings told us what mattered to begin with, and then, yeah, we do all this other work and we show off mathematically, and maybe we get a little mad about the G, right? We get a little mad about the coarse grain model, how it renormalized. But in general, the real problem is what do you care about? And I'll give you an example. So this is something that comes up a lot. We didn't talk about rate distortion theory. But rate distortion theory is essentially a story about how to balance the need for efficient representation and good representation. And the story from rate distortion theory goes like this. We have some real world. We have some perception apparatus. That's my little eye there. And that perception apparatus is going to eventually funnel things into the brain. And here's like a little spark of an idea in the brain. So we want to map the world, and we'll write that map as a set of states that the world could be in as x, into a set of states that we describe as x twiddle. So these are the list of states the world can be in, and this is the list of states your brain can be in. The eye's job, your brain's always in some state, you always got something in your mind. Your eye's job is to take this information here and use it to affect this information here. And one way to quantify how much your eye has to work, how hard it is to cram this down here, is to look at the mutual information between x and x twiddle. This is a good way to quantify how much work, how many neurons, for example, have to be involved in this stage, how many retinal cells have to be involved, and how quickly you can narrow down the data as it goes through your optic nerve, down the pathway, sort of squiggles around in there in ways that I don't really know about, okay? And ends up somewhere in your brain where you say like, okay, here's the real world. That's a tiger, okay? And then somewhere in here, you have this representation. That's a tiger. Now, in general, you're going to have some map, and we can represent the eye as probabilistically taking a state of the world and mapping it, taking a state of the world and mapping it into an internal representation. For the rate distortion story, this is your coarse graining. This is your coarse graining prescription, your projection operator. Now, there's two subtle things about this. The first one, this is not actually a hard clustering. This is a soft clustering. Right? In the chrome rose theorem, for example, we said, look, these states are exactly equivalent. Here, this will say, oh, you know, we saw something, it could be this or this. Right? But in general, the less accurate this is, the easier it is to find efficient transfer of information from the world to your brain. If I want to reproduce exactly what's going on in the world, right, I have to channel an enormous amount of information down my optic nerve. Now, does it really matter if the tiger is male or female? Does it really matter like if he took a shower that morning? Like it doesn't matter, right? If for you it's a tiger run. So there's a lot of coarse grainings that you can do right away that will save you on this observation step. Right? You see something dangerous run. But this coarse graining here can also be too aggressive. And so, for example, it's probably a really bad idea that if there's a tiger in your neighborhood, you confuse it with, you know, like a tree, right? Bad idea. So you want this mapping here to get some things right about the world. So now the problem becomes, okay, look, I want to throw information out. My eye doesn't need to keep track of everything. I want this, in other words, to be small, the mutual information between the world and my brain. You won't go into mutual information except to define it very briefly as the following. Let's say that I have some uncertainty, okay, in my brain state. How much is that altered? How much does that drop when I come to know the state of the world? So this is one way to write mutual information. And the way to think about it is how much work is your eye doing 
on your brain. You're thinking about all sorts of stuff. Something comes in, your eye is doing work on the brain here at this step to reduce your thoughts, to focus your thoughts, if you will, to reduce the entropy. So that's why you can think of I here, the mutual information, as a metric for how much has to flow down here. It's how much influence has to go into your brain to change, to lower the entropy of your thoughts. So that's your measure here. You want that to be small. You can make it as small as you like. One way to make it as small as you like is just to close your eyes and not take any information in. Right? In that case, right, no matter what happens in the world, it doesn't change what's going on outside of me until I actually do get eaten, and that's a different perceptual mode. Right? The other extreme is to map precisely. That's too expensive. So how do we figure out what the right p of x twiddle given x is? How do I figure out the right mapping between the world and what I think about the world? What rate distortion theory says, or makes clear, is that in fact, there's no good answer. Or rather, the answer has to be specified ahead of time. And what we do is we prescribe a distortion measure d x comma x twiddle. D is the penalty for what happens if the world is in state x and you think it's in state x twiddle. Right? So D world tiger, right? And you think that it's in the world is state tree, okay? This, right, this is very large. Bad penalty, right? Much greater than zero. Other kinds of distortions that you might have, right? The distortion, the, the problem of thinking that it's a tiger, right? But, you know, or it's a tiger in the real world, but you actually think it's like a bear, right? That's a bear, right? That's maybe a little bit greater than zero, like, you know, there might be something you want to do differently, but this confusion is not as bad as this confusion. And just to give you another example, the distortion measure need not be symmetric. So the distortion of thinking that a tree is actually a tiger, right? That distortion measure is not necessarily going to be zero, but it's probably going to be a lot less than the other confusion. In this case, there's a tree in the world, but your mental state says it's a tiger. Maybe you get a little embarrassed like your friends laugh at you. But over here, right, in this case, everyone's dead. So the distortion measure basically is something you fix from the outside. It's fixed by the world itself, and it tells you the costs of your coarse graining. And now all you have to do is solve a balancing problem. On the one hand, you have i, and you want that to be small. And on the other hand, you have d, the distortion, and you want that to be small. The problem is, is if you make this small, this goes up. And if you make this small, this goes up. And you have what's called a multi-objective optimization problem. And all that means is you're trying to optimize two things at once, which you can't do. You can only pick one. And so what you do is, in fact, combine these two into a single term, i plus beta average distortion. And you try to minimize that. The beta there, that beta tells you the trade-off, how much you care about having an efficient i versus how much you care about getting eaten by a tiger. So rate distortion theory is one way to think about solving this problem here. This is the story at least told by the physicist is generally like, pick the coarse graining that you probably know is going to work and it's the only one we care about. Rate distortion theory says, no, that's actually the critical problem. You have to be explicit about the kind of information you want to retain. And the more information you want to retain about the world, right, the more that you want to reduce this penalty here for being hurt by mistaken beliefs, the more you reduce that, the less you can coarse grain. You can't quite go all the way up to the coarse graining you might like. We don't talk so much about this part of the story, in part because as of yet, we don't really know how to specify these utility functions. It's something we get from economics. In economics, we all know what a utility function is and we're happy. In general, we don't know what this is for any particular problem. But this is, in general, the solution for how to pick the good coarse grainings, how to do this side right is to be explicit about the things you want to keep. When we do, for example, the coarse graining of the visual image, which is something, of course, that has enormous commercial potential, I don't think the engineers ever actually wrote down a distortion matrix 
what they were going to do. But they certainly did think about, okay, what do people tolerate and what do people not tolerate? It's the same thing whenever you do a lossy compression, whenever you build an MP3 or movie compression, a, uh, the uh, Apple's new compression algorithm that competes with MP3. In all those cases, they're trying to find coarse grainings. They're trying to find projections that people won't get too upset at. And the people who have like a warm tone problem with MP3s, like they probably don't have a lot of money because they spent it all on audio equipment anyway. So that's the final piece of the puzzle. I've given you a little sketch of, I think, what is missing from the renormalization story. I'd be remiss in saying that I haven't thought about this a great deal. And so with collaborators of the Santa Fe Institute, a bunch of us have tried to talk about this using something called state space compression. But in general, the problem of how to pick a projection remains. 